This morning I'm going to continue in my series on the Word became flesh. Remember, last Sunday we looked at the one who came, and we saw that this one who came is none other than the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, the eternal Word, the one who existed with God from all eternity, and the one who created everything, not one thing that has been created. Uh, He created everything so that not one thing that has been created was not created by him. He is the eternal, uncreated one. Today we're going to look at the truth of his coming. The Bible says grace and truth came by Jesus. Now, I wonder if you've spent a little time thinking about that. Most people don't. Most people say, well, I've got Jesus in my life, I've got Jesus in my heart, I'm happy, I'm I'm fulfilled, and that's what it's all about. No, 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 that's not what it's all about. A lot of people can find fulfillment in lots of different things, but what we trust in is not just wishful thinking. What we trust in is true. And increasingly in our society, We need to make sure that we know the reasons, not just for the season, but the reason for every season, the reason for believing and be able to know three things. What we believe, why we believe it, and how we can present that to others. When we talk about truth, many people are looking for happiness, not necessarily truth. I hope that you, as a Bible-believing, spirit-filled Christian, somebody who believes in the word of truth, the God who is truth, and the spirit of truth, and Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life, who says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and life. That God is a God of truth, and it matters to us whether it is really true. If it was not true, I wouldn't believe it. I would not be a Christian. I would not be a Christian if it was not true true, but it is true. We're going to have a look at some of those things today. Now you'll see from the screen that every time I speak to you, I I bring together all my thoughts in one take-home idea, one take-home message. Here is the take-home message. Everything that Jesus touches, he changes. Everything that Jesus touches, He transforms, and that's what the Christmas story is all about. And uh, the uh, notes that I've prepared for the cell meetings this coming week, starting from today, include that together with some questions on how you can apply this to your life. So pick up uh, those notes afterwards if you're a cell leader. By the way, don't forget that I do email them out to you uh, uh, by Saturday at the very latest. So we're turning in our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. We're going to read the story of the virgin birth of Jesus or the, this uh, particular message is the heart of Christmas. And reading from Matthew's version, there is also Luke who tells the same story. And when we compare Matthew with Luke, we find these are two independent witnesses And both of them depending on earlier witnesses. So this goes right back to the very beginning of the gospel preaching. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 to 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, And you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, 
until she had given birth to a son, and they called his name Jesus. Christmas, whatever else it is, is a good story. It is a story of love, a story of hope, a story of redemption and joy. It's also a romantic story. We see a young married couple. There is that firstborn child, beautiful. I mean, today, when the children came up on the platform, you were just, your eyes were moist, all of you. It's a romantic image. More than that, we find the simple faith of Mary and Joseph. We find their humility. It's a good news story. It's a feel-good story. But is it more than a story? Is it fact? Well, you know, we have a lot of things that take place at Christmas. Many traditional aspects to it, which is some of which you've seen today. And I'm not a killjoy when it comes to this kind of stuff. I believe that imagination is good. And tradition is good. And I have no problem using all the imagination and selecting all kinds of traditions which are not necessarily rooted in history or in fact. But it's good to embrace this stuff and enjoy it. But never at the expense of the truth itself. What can be quite confusing to some of our non-Christian friends who don't know about the legend of the three kings and don't know how to separate Santa Claus from Jesus or think it's all about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman and they have no way of distinguishing between that and the actual Christmas story itself. Fictional characters have appeared for generations. I looked up on the internet and found 20 of the most famous Christmas stories. Over the years, Christmas has inspired many authors to write about Christmas, its spirit and its significance, and they use uh, romantic techniques. They use fictional methods, but they, they are always talking about charity and forgiveness and friendship and unselfish love and generosity. And you, you find examples of the spirit of Christmas, but in, for the most part, those stories don't have a lot of Bible fact in them. They're charming and they're embellishing ideas, but they are not found in the Bible. So that's the first point of call. We turn to the Bible to find out Bible truth. And uh, there's a lot of legend uh, as well with this, and, and it's so intertwined with our Christmas that sometimes even we as Christians forget that, for example, the wise men were not there at the birth. Most Christmas cards will show it that way. And, and, and we have to go back to the Bible and just separate the kind of traditions and the legends, even the legend of the three kings. Now, I know there were magi, holy men, wise men from the east. That's what the Bible says. But the Bible never says there were three. And the Bible never says they were kings. The idea of three is kind of associated with the gifts they brought. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It's an assumption they were three. And the Western church picked this up from the end of the second century, the beginning of the third century, and talked about the three kings because there was a prophecy that kings would come. So they put it together. No harm in that, I guess. The Eastern church said there were 12. And Christmas is very much focused on that day, January the 6th, as they, as they call it. So we have to separate the, the myth and the legend from the facts. And by the way, the legend of the three kings developed over the centuries and in the Middle Ages, they're able with confidence, in quotes, to name them Melchior, Caspar, and Balthazar. Balthazar. Balthazar, beg your pardon. And uh, this is a medieval edition, and they went further. They said, we can tell you where they came from. Oh, can you? Yes, yes. They, they came from Africa, or some say India. Uh, probably, you know, one of them eating fufu as well. <laughs> Arabia and, and Europe. Well, none of that is in the Bible, and frankly, it rests on rather dodgy tradition. So how can we be sure? that Jesus actually came? How can we be sure that the central message of Jesus is real and is true? And it's an important question. Because a lot of people say, you religious people can believe what you like in private. We don't have to take it seriously. You're not dealing in fact. You're dealing in opinion. You're dealing in faith. We deal with science and reason. Well, we shall see about that in a moment. 
But when we turn to the Scriptures, we discover that the Bible asserts, and we've got good reason to believe it, as I'll go into, that God really came. That God was really manifested in the flesh. The Word really became flesh. So you can be sure because it is an historical record, it is a physical fact. But some will say, wait, wait a bit. How, how can we be sure that the Bible got it right? How can we be sure that the Gospels are true? I've got three reasons. Number one, when we turn to the pages of the New Testament, we can be absolutely sure that it is an accurate record of the original documents. So you say, well, I've never even thought about that. Well, one of your friends will have. And some of the people are very skilled in debating this way. They say, show us the original documents. Well, you can't. Why can't we? It stands to reason. At that time, writing was not ever in any kind of permanent form. And the kind of letters and records that were kept at that time were kept on papyrus paper. And that didn't last very long. We have some, some scraps of that left, but they don't last very long. So how can we be sure that the Bible was preserved? How can we be sure the New Testament was preserved? Very, very easy. We have copies of copies of copies of copies, and many of them, thousands of them, actually, in the Greek language only, 5,600. And from that, we can be absolutely sure that to a very, very large degree of accuracy, the New Testament of today corresponds to the New Testament that was actually written. You say, well, that's, why is that important? Think about it. Some of the major historical documents which relate to historical figures at this particular time of ancient history, they rest on just a handful of documents, some hundreds, many hundreds of years, sometimes 800, 900 years later, on a handful of documents. No, no, no. We're on sure ground of history to say that the New Testament is an accurate record of what was originally written. Another sure ground is that these records were early accounts, very, very early on. Did you notice when I spoke about the legend of the three kings, it took a hundred or more years for them to say there were three and to say they were kings, a few more hundred years to say that what their names were. Legends take time to develop over many, many years, and when people study legend, they find out that no legend actually is sustained or develops within eyewitness living memory. So in other words, if the New Testament was written very early, all of the Gospels, all of the New Testament, written before A.D. 70, that's not Colin Dye speaking, that is a pretty good consensus of even some liberal and radical scholars who acknowledge that the New Testament is an early account based on eyewitnesses, Matthew and Luke, independent witnesses, all talking about the virgin birth, both of them talking about the virgin birth, both of them not borrowing from each other, but sources which go right back to within years, decades at the most, of the events. And nobody can stand up and say something with the eyewitnesses present without being cross-examined or being uh, contradicted if they're wrong. You see this yourself. If you notice an event, you were witness to an event in your locality, and a couple of days later it's in the local newspaper, you can compare what the newspaper reports with what you saw. And if it doesn't compare, you know it's not an accurate record. You can set the record straight. No, the New Testament is both accurate and early, and it is also reliable. Why is it reliable? Independent witnesses, including in the, in the New Testament, many historical details that could only be recorded by people who were there. I remember hearing the Roman histor his historian, uh, Colin Hamer, Professor Colin Hamer, who, who's passed away at the moment, uh, and he, he spoke of 84 historical details which were so detailed from Acts chapter 13 to the end of the book of Acts that only an eyewitness, only somebody who was there would be able to recount them. 
For example, the names of minor politicians, even their very nicknames, local slang words, weather patterns, water depths, all of these show that the New Testament was not an invention, but people wrote down what they saw, what they heard, what they'd researched and found out for themselves. And even more than all of this, virtually all of the apostles and those people involved in bringing the New Testament to us lost their lives because of it. Now think about it. Will people die for a lie? Yeah, it happens. Why? Because they, they believe it to be true. Why do suicide bombers do it? They believe they're doing something right, but they're doing something very wrong. Just to believe something that's a lie doesn't make it the truth. But nobody who is of reputable character, a trustworthy person, is going to be prepared to die for a lie that they know is a lie and one they've made up. I can just imagine somebody coming and saying, okay, now then, do you renounce your testimony? Um, well, actually, on pain of death, let me tell you, I was only joking. I was making up some nice stories for the children. No, no, no. These people knew it was true. They believed it was true. And they died believing it. They believed it was true. And the only explanation for them believing it was true is because they witnessed it. So we can be sure that the New Testament, the Gospels, and the Christmas story with its angels, with its miracles, that is the truth as people saw it. And you, we can demonstrate it to a very large degree, but even that is not enough. I wonder, let me ask you this question, I mean it sincerely. I wonder how many people came to Christ because you studied all the evidence of science, of archaeology, of biblical studies, and said, I am convinced that this is true, therefore I give my life to Christ. How many came to Christ that way? Well, they do exist. But most of us came to Christ when we met him. We met him. And we put our faith in the revelation that God gave us. However, to leave it there is both lazy and unwise. Because there are people out there who say, well, you say it's Christ. Somebody else says it's something else. Somebody else believes something else. You have your beliefs and they have their beliefs. This may be true for you, but that's true for them. Because what we believe in is not just our truth. It is gospel truth. It is God's truth. And if it is true for us, it's true for everybody. If it is a fact that Jesus came, then whether we believe it or anybody believes it, it's irrelevant. He came. Do you get the point? And truth is what relates to facts. Now then, if somebody says to you, well, you believe he came, not exactly sometimes they say this, prove it to me, but sometimes they say, what are your reasons for believing the Bible says we should be absolutely prepared to give people a reason for the faith that is in us. And why not only that we believe, but that we put our trust in what we believe. We have to give a good testimony, give a good witness. We are called to be witnesses. We need answers to these things. Don't be a lazy Christian. Say, well, I believe and that's enough for me. That may be enough for you, but how do you know that what you believe is true? How do you know that? Well, Colin says so. Well, how? Well, that's no reason. That's no reason. You've got to examine this for yourselves. An unexamined faith is not a very sturdy faith. I say that because increasingly, lies and more lies are being put out by the media who are very largely run by godless people who have an axe to grind and they are trying to persuade people to their point of view. We need to look at the evidence. Are you ready, people of God? Are we going to do that? Now then, I want to draw the distinction today between believing that something is true and putting your faith and trust in it. You will never argue people into the kingdom. Don't even try. Give them reasons, show where the evidence leads, but they still have to make their choice. Somebody can be totally convinced. Well, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And you say, and? And they say, and what? So, so what? They might believe that it's true. Even the devil knows it's true. 
but you've got to put your trust in Jesus. That's where faith comes in. It's rather like every time you step on an aeroplane. This is, in my mind, this is the kind of plane I fly very... Well, I don't, you know, I don't sit in the driver's seat, but, you know, I, I'm in all the time, and I'm very at ease with flying. I have to be there, been to the moon and back again in terms of uh, air miles and everything like that. My, my footprint, carbon footprint, probably cover London. But I thought about this. Just take a look at that aeroplane. I mean, it will weigh a lot. 77.8 metric tons. So what? What is a metric ton? 1,000 kilograms. 78.7 thousand... 77.8 thousand kilograms. That is a lot of metal to get off the air. How is it possible? So one day you get in there, how am I going on the plane? How is this, all this metal going to fly? Well, he's done it before. Well, how do I know it's going to do it again? How is this going to work? So you have a friend who's traveling with you who happens to be a science teacher. And so they say, well, let me give you a brief rundown of the laws of aerodynamics. There's such a thing as lift because of the shape of the wings. There is uh, low pressure, high pressure, and, and it lifts the wing. And you know the lift that is caused by the shape of the wings and the speed of the plane is enough to lift it all. And, 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 and the, the speed at which it goes, the thrust is enough to overcome the force acting the opposite direction, drag. So you say, lift, weight, thrust, drag. Just remember those things. Lift, weight, thrust, drag. Lift, I'm still not getting on the plane. You can be intellectually convinced you might even have had previous experience of this. But you know, every time you step on that plane, you are putting your faith in something. So it's not just believing that it is true. It is putting your faith in it. That's what gets you saved. And that's my second point. My first point is that you can be sure this is historical fact. It happened in a physical way. It's not just a nice story to talk about the birth of something nice and new. This really happened in flesh and blood. And any birth that I've had anything to be around has got a lot of blood. It is right and real. So, second thing. Because it is true, you can make a decision to trust it. If Jesus is real, if Jesus is true, you can step into that truth and you can be saved. And this is important to know. Did you notice at the middle of this story, there is one of the most amazing and hotly contested miracles of the whole Bible? I remember sharing the gospel with one of my colleagues way, way, way back. Oh, what? A virgin conceiving, coming home with the story, I'll tell you what really happened. She got up to some hanky-panky. And so she made up the story. An angel came, an angel came. And because they're all religious and stupid, they believed it. Is that the case? Why would you even think that it's impossible? If God created the universe, this is a small thing. Well, miracles don't happen. Too late. They've already happened. <laughs> the greatest miracle of all has already taken place. It's you, the creation. And if God created the universe, it's a small thing for him to do something within it. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, God would not break the laws of nature. Wait a bit. So you admit God made him. No, no, no. The laws of nature cannot be broken. How do you know? How do you know? Well, the sun will rise tomorrow in the way it rose yesterday. No, how do you know? You don't really know. It's assumption. The only way you know the sun will raise to rise tomorrow is not just because of natural law that assumes regularity. It's because you know who is going to be behind it all. The God who created the universe is the God who acts in it. And why is this miracle necessary, the virgin birth? Why is it necessary? Have you ever thought about that? We've got all kinds of fanciful theological reasons to it, but imagine if God said to Jesus, you're coming down, oh wait, wait a bit, do I have to go through that? You know, you've got to make me man, I've got to become man, I'll just float down from heaven, fully formed as a male. 
human being. God said, no, no, no. We need something that will show everybody that you are fully human and that you've gone through everything we've gone through. The one exception to this conception was that it was not natural, but supernatural. We know that Joseph had nothing to do with it, okay? We know that she was a virgin when she conceived, and she was a virgin, Mary was a virgin, when she gave birth. So where did that embryo come from? The Holy Spirit created that embryo as a miracle, a fully human embryo. Mary had nothing to do with it. Joseph had nothing to do with it. Mary was the vehicle. It's absolutely amazing. Too amazing, actually, for some people to believe. Let me just show you how amazing our natural world is just for a moment. Put that up on the screen. Here we have a picture of the universe. Where is Scott? Is Scott ready to help me? Can you come? He's not. He's Colin's little helper, not Santa's. Okay. Uh, this picture is, is actually a map of the whole universe, which was constructed from information gained from the Planck satellite very recently. And what you're seeing there is the evidence of the background radiation at the very edges of the universe, scientists say, reflecting the very beginning of the universe. But that's a, a pretty real map, and it's vast. They say there are as many galaxies as there are sands in the seashores of every coast in the world. Galaxies, not just suns, galaxies. I mean, it is enormous. And if you calculate the width of the, of the, the size of the universe, it's very, very, very big. It's vast. Now, an important concept that we as believers understand points to God as the designer is also something that scientists are struggling with. They are amazed the more they discover about the universe how precise it is. It makes a Swiss clock look like nothing. It is so complicated, and it is also so finely tuned. There are 12 of these facts which show that if there's a variation in any one of these details, we would not exist. One detail. Gravity exists in the universe, a very important one of the four forces. Very important, gravity. If gravity itself varied even to a tiny degree, Galaxies would not exist, the sun would not exist, and we would not exist. Do you want to know what that small degree is? If there was a variation of the force of gravity in 1 by 10 to the power of 40, we would not exist. You don't look impressed. I'll tell you why. Because you can't imagine what 10 with 40 zeros actually looks like. Let me show you what it is. You take this here. We're going to convert that and just walk backwards. Long side we. We're going to convert that into a tape measure. And I want you to imagine, go back, go, go back as far as you can go. All right. If we were able to stretch out a tape measure across the whole of the universe, the degree of fine tuning I've just described would relate to one inch on a tape measure stretched right across the whole known universe. Do you see how precise God is? Can you see how finely tuned our universe is? Thank you very much. A round of applause. He didn't do much, but he was important. So we live in a universe created by God, and a God, of course, can step into it. He can do what he wants with it, and he's superintending it, ensuring everything happens according to his plan and purpose, and at right times, right moments, for right purposes, he will do a miracle. And all of that is eminently reasonable and logical. But atheists won't believe it. I mean, they won't believe it. I'm going to give you quotes from two famous atheists to show a hint at why they won't believe it. It's not because it's not reasonable. It's not because it doesn't make sense. It's because they don't 
want to believe it. And why don't they want to believe it? It's not an intellectual problem. It's, as one atheist says, it's a cosmic authority problem. They don't want to bow the knee to anybody. That's the reason. Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, if you've done any A-level work or any reading whatsoever or met anybody involved in this, you will know that Nietzsche was the one who said, God is dead. And then proudly, we have killed him. Notice, it's not Christians who invent God. It is non-Christians who deny him. Then he goes on to say this in one candid moment. If one were to prove this God of the Christians to us, if somebody could prove it, what does he say? We should be even less able to believe him. What? Surely if you can prove it, they'd believe. No, no, no. Because it is in many ways proved to a very large degree, but there's a resistance other than the intellect. The real problem is moral and spiritual. They don't want to bow the knee to some cosmic authority. Professor Thomas Nagel uses exactly that terminology. Listen carefully and see if it is a a kind of neutral, unbiased, open mind that is writing these words. I want atheism to be true. Does that sound like a scientist? Does it sound like somebody seeking the truth? No, I want atheism to be true. And I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. Makes me uneasy that clever people believe this. Why? He's scared there's something in it. Then he goes on to say, it isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. He's just hoping. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. My guess that this cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition. Well, there's an honest atheist. Have ever you met, met one? So this is about choice. The evidence is there. Whether you discovered it and therefore gave your life to Christ, or you gave your life to Christ because of the revelation of God to your spirit, and then afterwards said, wow, look at all the reasons for believing. I made the right choice. It's reasonable. There is evidence for this. So you say, I believe it, and I put my trust. I transfer my trust from myself, and I bow the knee to that cosmic authority, which is more than just an authority. He's a person. He is the Word made flesh. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is the one who came and lived amongst us and showed us how to be holy and human and gave his life for us on the cross. We know him personally, not some remote cosmic authority that we submit to. We make a choice because we know it is true and we know we need a miracle to make it happen. That's what the miracle story of Christmas is about. God says, I want to save you, and it's going to take a miracle from me. You cannot save yourself. Mary could not have made herself pregnant without the natural means of getting pregnant. God had to do it. It had to be God or nothing. And I tell you, that's the foundation of our faith. Salvation is from the Lord. It's a miracle from start to finish. You cannot save yourself. The only way you can be saved is if the supernatural God steps into your situation, touches your life, so that what he touches, he also transforms. Oh yeah, God is real. You can be sure. And you can trust him for your salvation. But there's something else that this story tells me. And I love it. I love it because it comes right home to where I am. Where do you live? You live where I live. You live where every human being lives. You live in the real world. The world of pressure. 
The world where physical laws operate. The world where you have to earn your living, buy your house, pay for your mortgage, pay for your rent. You live in the real world. And when God came down from heaven into this earth, he says, I'm going to sit where you sit. I'm going to learn what it is to be human. And I'm going to show you that it is possible to live for God in the real world. That's what makes it so amazing. And it's not just that he sits there and goes through life saying, okay, been through that, take me back, beam me up, Father, I've done here. No, no, no. He successfully lives for God. One of the reasons why God created the embryo in total was that he was making a second Adam, an Adam without sin. The first Adam was made without sin, but chose to sin. The second Adam was made without sin. Not put into a garden, but initially put into the womb of Mary as a tiny embryo and then a fetus. And then was born in the usual way. God was saying, this is the second time round. And the second Adam was sent into the world to undo all that the first Adam had done. The second Adam had come into the world to touch the world in a real physical way. So much so that the early apostles could say, we have seen him. We've sat with him. We ate with him. We heard him. We touched him. We know he is real. And into the real world, Jesus came. He was tempted. He was tested. He was tested right to the point of death and beyond. And he conquered in everything. Whatever he touched, he transformed. And finally, through his life on the earth, he leaves behind a promise that you and I can live for God in the real world. You and I can go through all the pain and suffering and rejection that this world will throw at us. And we know that we are founded on a foundation stronger than anything we could ever see, even though others saw him, others spoke to him, others testified. We rely on their testimony and we rely on the Holy Spirit creating the life of God in us just like Mary did. Nothing is too difficult for God. Is anything impossible with God? No. Jesus came into the world to change it. He began to do that in a very way, tiny, tiny, small, small. The kingdom of God is like a seed sown. It's not immediately visible, but then it grows and bears forth fruit. And finally, its leaves and branches and fruit, fruit cover the whole world. That's where we're heading. The glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. He came into this physical world to redeem it. Of course, the souls of men and women. But we are not just soul people. We are body, soul, spirit people. He came to redeem your body. And in the meantime, you say, God, help me put up with this old body. And but I'm the, a new one is coming. Because because whatever he touches, he transforms and he changes. So we know that we can live for God and be faithful. Jesus has shown us how. We can live for God and believe him. Even when the world is against us, remember that Jesus is the light that shines into the world and the darkness is never going to overcome it. We know that if we keep on following the light, we're going to come to that glorious consummation when the light is switched on to full force and all darkness shall go, all sin shall go, all sickness shall go, all suffering shall go. And in place of that, God will recreate a new universe, new heavens and a new earth, which will be the home for the people of righteousness. Amen and amen. We are headed for good things, folks. Amen. In fact, Jesus even says that we're going to inherit it all. So you are investing in your spiritual life. You don't take it on blind faith. You meet him. You experience him. And then you test out that app to see, have I experienced the right one? Is my experience real and valid? Does it relate to truth or is it just a nice feeling? No. When you test it out, you find that it rests on solid evidence. This is the truth of his coming. And when we learn that, we can be confident when somebody says to you, well, you know, I don't believe he came. I don't believe he's born of a virgin. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. So we say, well, I do. Why? Why? How do you believe that? I don't know. I just believe. That's not persuasive. What's persuasive is to say, if God created the universe, then this is a small miracle. 
by comparison to the one that you already live in. And then you can say, whatever Jesus touches, he transforms. You can say, Jesus took a hold of my life X number of years ago. He touched me. And I know it's not just blind faith. I know it's not just a feeling. I know it is not just fanciful ideas. I know it is real. Here is the reasons for it. But the most important thing is not just to believe that it is true, but I put my faith and trust in Christ, and this is what has happened. And I'll tell you, your testimonies will have lots of different details. It will vary from person to person. Every one of us has a unique story. But there is one common theme. The light came and the darkness left. Christ was born in my spirit and I was born again by the power of God, not according to the will of the flesh, not according to the will of a husband, but by the power of God born from above. Jesus touched my life and because he touched my life, everything is changed. And then we go with that assurance to shine. Every time you look at a Christmas light, remember why it's there. To remind you of the light of the world coming into this world. And the one who said, you are also the light of the world. Reflect my light into the world. And so that as you touch the lives of other people, your family at Christmas time, your neighbors, your friends, people at work, remember Speak out. We have the legal right to do so. Do it wisely. Do it responsibly. But we can do it. And when we do that, we can bring change into our families, change into our communities. We can shine in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Say, this world is full of darkness. Oh, yeah, 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 but rise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen on you. That's the Christmas story.